So good morning. My name is Susan Breel, and I'm a judge in the San Francisco Superior Court, and I am co-chair of the San Francisco Collaborative Against Human Traffic. And today is really the finale of SFCAP's human trafficking prevention and public awareness campaign. And this is the time we will announce officially the award winners from the high school and middle school poster and writing contest. So I just want to begin by acknowledging all of you um, high schoolers and middle schoolers who are here and really who have the foresight and the passion and uh, the determination to, uh, to try out for this contest, these, these two contests, because through your participation, you've not only become more keenly aware of modern day slavery, um, the objectification and exploitation of men and women and so many children everywhere, but through the awareness you've gained by, by your mere participation in this contest, you have become modern day warriors, every one of you, in a social justice movement to end human trafficking forever in our communities and in our lifetimes. So I want to thank every young person who has applied to be in this contest. Um, just a word about SFCAP. In 2008, the San Francisco Department of the Status of Women, the Human Rights Commission, and the National Council of Jewish Women of San Francisco brought together um, government and non-government sectors for a coordinated response to modern-day slavery occurring in the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, San Francisco Collaborative Against Human Trafficking works to end human trafficking in the San Francisco Bay Area through collaboration, education, and advocacy. So, um, SFCAT envisions schools at the center of human trafficking prevention. Schools are really safe havens for many students, for many at-risk youth. And when students are empowered to educate themselves about dangers of human trafficking, it has been shown that the rates of victimization, the rates of human trafficking of youth decrease significantly. And I would like to now call upon the President, not of the United States, but the President of the United Nations Association USA, San Francisco chapter, Mary Steiner to say a few words.
pay tribute to my personal hero, Harriet Tubman. Yay. Harriet Tubman, one of the most famous African American abolitionists, and uh, I wrote a book report on her in the third grade, so <laughs> she's never left me. She was born into slavery in Maryland in 1822. She was five feet tall, my height, and was disabled. Um, she uh, sustained a head injury by one of her masters who became something very heavy at her head. Uh, she escaped slavery at the age of 27 through the Underground Railroad, and then she became a conductor. She spent the next 11 years going back and forth, returning to Maryland nearly 20 times to rescue 70 slaves and provide instructions for another 60 on how to escape to the North. She earned the nickname Moses for bringing these slaves to freedom. So this is one African American disabled former slave in the pre-Civil War South, securing freedom for almost 130 people. In fact, she became one of the nation's most wanted fugitives with a reward offer over her lifetime, totally something like over a million dollars for her capture. So surely the challenges we face today are not no, are not anywhere near the challenges that Harriet you know, Tubman faced. So I want to celebrate today's powerful collaboration and use our collective power to end slavery in our community. Cheryl Davis with the Human Rights Commission. I'm so grateful to be here and to be a part of this legacy. I was talking with Antonia, and it has already been mentioned that the Human Rights Commission was one of um, the beginning partners in this effort and this initiative. And so just a couple of things that I want to leave you with and really hope plant the seed as we talk about human trafficking, as we think about the narrative of what that is. There are a couple of things, and I really appreciated Emily, Dr. Rossley's comments. Um, I used to be a kindergarten teacher, and one of my favorite poems was actually about Harriet Tubman. And what I appreciate most is what I think um, SF CAT represents, what it, the folks who helped start it represent. And that is the ability to be fearless in the face of adversity and in the face, in the face of whatever traumatic events. And this poem about Harriet Tubman says, Harriet Tubman didn't take no stuff, wasn't scared enough from women. Didn't come in this world to be no slave and didn't stay one either. Farewell, she sang to her friends one night. She was mighty sad to think of, but she ran away that hot dark night, ran looking for her friends. And so when we think about this work and when we think about what it is that we're trying to do, no one is for sale. This idea, this notion that we are fighting for freedom even today, but the bigger piece of this for me is that we have to really begin to open our eyes in terms of what slavery looks like today, in terms of what freedom loss looks like. There are young people literally two blocks down from here living in public housing that are being trafficked, that are often being looked over and passed by. And so part of this is who are we going, how are we going to help people be fearless and step up? I appreciate this work, and so I leave you with another one of my favorite poems, because I think the people in this room today represent the ability to move forward and not to be held down by fear. And so one of my favorite poets is Maya Angelou, and she has a poem called Life Doesn't Frighten Me at All. And in it, she says, don't show me flaws and snakes, and listen for my screams. If I'm afraid at all, it's only in my dreams. I have a magic charm, that I keep up my sleeve. Life doesn't frighten me at all, not at all. Life doesn't frighten me at all. So I thank you all so much for taking the charge to fight for me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
Foundation's project in the new school cohort. So um, I will have the pleasure to moderate. And I will try to bounce off this chair. So, uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge, uh, uh, to recognize uh, a few more people in the room. First of all, I want to recognize Benita Hopkins, uh, our other presenter. And she will be the program later today. I want to acknowledge uh, also uh, Julie Su as past co-chair of the Coagulary. <laughs> and I want to acknowledge Nancy Gober. Can you stand up, Nancy? Uh, she is a co-founder of the Coagulary and our poster contest started on the idea of Nancy Gober. She is the mother of this contest, if I can say. So, we celebrate 20 years uh, of anniversary of the United Nations uh, Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime and the uh, protocol to this convention specific to the anti trafficking work. It's a great anniversary. I cannot believe that it's been 20 years because I remember when it was passed and it makes me already old. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, we are very lucky to have Michael here. Uh, Michael is not only familiar with the legislation, but as prosecutor, he can speak more about the enforcement of this legislation. Michael, we want to start with uh, presenting the legislation? Um, no, because as a lawyer, you know, we hate to talk, so. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, folks. Uh, look, how many people here know what a treaty is? Hands up. A treaty. Good, right. A treaty is simply two countries decide and agree as to certain aspects of a relationship between them. It's a consensual agreement. A convention simply means it's a treaty where you have a lot of countries, not just two. And in this case, uh, the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime with its attached protocol. Uh, it's about, at this point, I understand there is 183 uh, countries who have signed and ratified. In 2000, it was written and signed. In 2003, it took effect. What you've got is, and we're not going to go through the transnational organized crime uh, convention here, we're going to go to the attached agreement, which has to do with human trafficking. And I can simply tell you that as someone who was in Kosovo at the time after serving in Bosnia with the UN, every single country I've ever been in has trafficking of humans not just the one we're sitting in now. That certainly is one. But uh, South Sudan, Indonesia, Bosnia, Serbia, Kosovo, Egypt, Turkey, Afghanistan, UAE, Dubai. In all of those countries, you have the scourge. You have this problem. You have something that has to be stopped. And people are trying to stop it, but obviously organized crime is there. Because unfortunately there's a demand for those services and there are people who don't care when they pay for certain services. I've got to turn my page. So, so one thing I wanted to point out for those of you who'd like to learn more about the international aspects, and at the risk of sounding like uh, Bernie or Elizabeth Warren, please go to this website. You nodc.org that is United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime unodc.org that is the international United Nations agency that is charged with educating and making sure that the convention and the protocols are implemented around the world so there's a lot
lot of very good information on that website. Later on, as you go through school, if you're very much interested in this and want to follow it up, they take interns starting with college interns and law school or other graduate school interns. So please take a look at that website. Uh, UNODC drafts laws, creates anti-trafficking strategies. They have what's called the Blue Heart, because the United Nations calls it blue, Blue Heart campaign on this issue. Uh, we don't have time for me to go through a lot of lawyer talk, which is good. You don't need to sleep by then. But like what we have here in the U.S., because the law was based upon what is in Article 3 of the protocol that is attached to the U.N. Uh, Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, trafficking in persons, yes, I see we're going to have a timekeeper for me. Okay. Well, I'm a lawyer. Give me a time. Keep in place. Just give me a figure and survive. Three. Trafficking in persons is recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring, or receipt of trafficked persons. That's the first requirement. One of those things. Recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring, or receipt. Then, if it's not a child, if the person is over 18, the victim, then you have you have to use certain means. So it's either force, coercion, fraud, deception, payments, or benefits. That means simple money payments or deception. I'm going to give you a quick example in my own experience in a case I had in Kosovo as a UN international prosecutor where women from Moldova including under 18, so children, were told, come to Kosovo. There's a whole bunch of international uh, soldiers, international police and staff workers, the UN, and we're opening restaurants and we need waitresses. Okay, excuse the sexism, now we're just ser server, but back then it was waitresses to work there. And Moldova is in Europe, but it's very, very poor generally terms of the country as a whole, so people would be deceived, one of the means under the protocol, to go there. That was enough to trigger the uh, protocol because trafficking was, they were transported there, they were uh, harbored there, they were recruited there, they were, by use of deception, and it was for the exploitation of prostitution, forced labor, and other services. Okay? So, without more, I'm going to go through a couple examples because I understand that's why you wanted to increase the average median age here by another 30 years. So, therefore, let me give you two. I spent 2000. Sorry, 1996, please, I know that's before you showed up. 1996, we, we didn't have cars there, and we even had cell phones. And there were flip phones, so you wouldn't have liked them. 1996 to, 90, to 2000, I was in Bosnia. The Bosnian War ended December 1996. Here is some more homework for you, and I really, really think your teachers will give you two hours credit to watch a movie. This is the movie, and I'm very serious about it. Please write it down. It's called The Whistleblower, okay? The Whistleblower. It's 2011. It's got uh, Rachel Weisz, the actor, as uh, the protagonist, who was a United States police officer who was of Balkans. Her origin, her family came from the Balkans, so she wanted to go back and help as a UN police officer, in the same way I was a prosecutor in Bosnia, and I was advising the prosecution, she was a police officer to advise the Bosnian police. She was hired by an American company, and this is true, called Dyncorp, D-Y-N-C-O-R-P. And she was there, she witnessed trafficking, she witnessed that the trafficking was not supported by 
but the trafficking was at customers who were fellow American police officers. Officers she served with in the UN, Amer a former American police officers who got leave, went over, and used the services of the trafficked women and girls. She found this out. She reported it in horror to the bosses at Dynport. They told her to shut up. She kept on trying to work on it. Uh, Vanessa Redgrave, who was a great actress, uh, she then played the role of Madeline Reese, a UN colleague of mine. Uh, that went national and international news. And in the end, all that happened was, unfortunately, uh, Catherine Bolshevik, uh, played by Rachel Weisz, was fired. Nothing happened to any of the Americans except they were told, your, your term here should end short uh, before your contract's up, why don't you just go back home? Nor did the United States government prosecute them, which they had the jurisdiction to do, once they got back into the United States. It's a very sad but true thing, and to make sure that you watch it, those of you who are Benedict Cumberbatch fans, <laughs> he's in this movie, he plays a nasty prison guard, but that will give you a little bonus. The Whistleblower 2011. And as my time ticks down, I'm going to give you two more reading assignments. Uh, and I'll give this later to uh, Mary and Antonia, and they can give it to you if you want. But you should take a look at a law review, the University of Pennsylvania Law Review, volume 158, page 1779, that talks about uh, not just that, but an incident that I personally witnessed in Kosovo, sorry, in Bosnia. In Bosnia, the American government after the 1996 war said what we need with three ethnic groups fighting is sort of a neutral place where they can have a marketplace and trade goods because America is all about a free market. This is during the Clinton years. So at that point, the United States Army actually started what was called the Arizona Market because it was on a route called Arizona Route. Uh, I was there in Bosnia with the UN. We were monitoring it. And I'll tell you what happened when I was asked to go along for a raid late at night. We went in with police. We did not have any American police with us. I had a lot of other countries' police, mostly European. We went in because we had had complaints. We found that in one of these, when one of these clubs, which advertised uh, see girls dance, etc., kind of a sleazy sort of strip joint type club, we found out that there was a back room we had gotten from one Bosnian judge, a search warrant. In the back room was a drawer with about two, overall it was 200 passports of young girls and women who had come from Moldova and other surrounding places. That person turned out to be the leader of an organized crime syndicate. And by the way, although they were at war with each other, the Croats, the Bosniaks, and the Serbian, ethnically, all worked together in the crime syndicate. The war didn't stop this because it was money. And we ended up managing to break them up. But when we took them to court, most of them disappeared, and it turns out they had bribed the judges. But at least we made a dent. But the sad thing is that Arizona market was famous. So famous, we found that one of my UN police colleagues from the United States had bought a 19-year-old Romanian woman to be his, air quotes, housekeeper, and he expected not just a hot dinner and his place cleaned and his laundry done, but sex upon demand. And her passport was held by him until she worked a year. He had bought her 
for 5,000 euros, about $6,000, for a year's work. And that was unfortunately with international folks. So I'm not talking about these are people right after a war in the country. I'm talking about we are supposed to be the UN, the US, the folks that are there for the victims. And instead, some of the internationals actually preyed upon them. Uh, finally, three years after they put it up, the United States Army took down a plaque in Arizona market saying, taking credit for making the Arizona market because the United States government, USAID, gave $100,000 plus to set up the Arizona market. And they knew what was going on. They had gotten reports. And it took years before you took that plaque down. Uh, wherever I've been, this has been a problem, including Kosovo, including Afghanistan. Uh, I don't have time to go through all of it now. Uh, but please, uh, read you're interested in that law review, it's mostly stuff that's not law. And, re and again, the movie is worth seeing, and the basic bits about the movie, unfortunately, are true. No one can say they, I'm talking about countries now, have only clean hands. No one. And I'm very happy to see that in the younger generation, there's a lot of people here that want to do something about it. Thank you. We realized that we would be worked uh, in very close locations. At that time, I was in Bulgaria prosecuting human trafficking and involved in legislative work as well. Uh, but uh, speaking of the region and what happened in Kosovo, Bosnia, uh, we had uh, a few years ago uh, not Maria Grazia, the previous uh, uh, special rapporteur on human trafficking uh, of the United Nations visiting, and she publicly acknowledged that the new wave of sex trafficking uh, as an organized form of crime started from Kosovo, unfortunately. And it started because of the presence of so many men with the UN uh, forces there. Uh, the United Nations has acknowledged that many times, recognized this problem, and there are many trainings for uh, um, the specifically focus on training the pers personnel and the militaries in the military forces of the United Nations. But uh, let's speak a little bit about how we make the law on the books work. Because the International Convention, the protocol, created a, an excellent foundation for the work against human trafficking. Uh, this foundation uh, was adopted by all these countries that you mentioned that ratified the protocol, including the United States, our federal legislation and the state legislation are fully based in these regulations, but they only work because we have the people on the ground, the people who enforce the laws. And speaking of uh, the enforcement, we, as you all by now know, we uh, derived from the convention four main areas of work in the anti trafficking field. We call them the four Ps, um, um, and these are prevention, um, prosecution, and punishment. This is the second. Um, protection of the victims, and Hillary Clinton added the fourth a few years ago, partnership. And this is literally the collaboration. So our um, young leaders here will speak on how they implement the convention in their local communities. And I will start with Zoe. Zoe is one of the leaders of uh, the United Nations Associations in Murin. 
She's more than this place. It's the only human trafficking cooperated with our friend uh, Laurel Bosworth. So, uh, Zoe, please let us know what was your project and what, please emphasize what parts of the protocol of this international United Nations agenda uh, you helped to implement globally. Hi, so, um, as Andrea mentioned, my name is Zoe. And Some people were like, oh no, we can't, but we're happy to advertise. 
to see it interactive. So a way that we did it was we had a Kahoot. So who here knows what a Kahoot is? Oh yeah, students. So basically through a Kahoot, we kind of like tested the knowledge from the presentation and the person who won won a gift card, which I think was pretty fun in the audience. Justice 
Services that was um, executive, de uh, executive Director, Founder and Principal of Lenny. And um, we are presenting the Lillian Foreman. Was that the slide? The, the Lillian, for Lillian for Foreman uh, Memorial. No, we just get two slides. I'm trying to figure out which one. So we are presenting the Lillian Foreman Memorial Scholarship supported by our member uh, Robin Brazo. Everybody knows her in this group and uh, her family. And Linda is one of the founders of our scholarships program. I'm waiting for the checks. <laughs> and I just want to say um, I knew Lillian Foreman very well, and we know her daughter who funded this scholarship in her memory. Lillian Foreman was a great worker for human rights and civil rights, and her daughter certainly, as a teacher in, in the schools here, uh, 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 worked every day for justice in, uh, and equity for students. Uh, they would be so happy to have your group, Rose, Receive the two scholarships uh, that will help survivors of human trafficking and prevention of human trafficking uh, for justice. Just to touch on, they're both college students and they're both uh, young adults. I'm extremely grateful and appreciative, as am I, for this opportunity to uh, encourage them uh, and encourage other individuals that have either have lived experience or are at risk. And so thank you very much. And it's, it's rare, it's not rare, but as an attorney working with trafficked persons quite often, we're dealing with very heavy situations and topics, and for to get have two clients be ecstatic and thrilled and just so grateful is uh, made my day. I shared that information with uh, Antonia. It's just it's, it's refreshing to see. So we're we're so grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Recipient of uh, Modern Day Abolition is Award, Katiana Taki. Uh, she's representing the Asian Women Shelter. And uh, we have good news about the second scholarship of the National Council of Jewish Women, which is for uh, this is our Nancy Second Memorial Scholarship for Survivors of Human Trafficking. And Katiana will speak about the clients of the organizations provide. Thank you so much, Antonia. Uh, for those of you who I met, I'm Katiana. It's like, hey, Tiana. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am from Asian Women's Shelter. It's a 32-year-old organization that uh, provides support services for domestic violence and human trafficking survivors in 40 languages. We are one of the very first um, organizations that work towards language access, and we still need to do it, continue to do so right now. Um, I am the anti-trafficking uh, program services, uh, program services coordinator, and I've been uh, with the Asian Home Center for 20 years, long time. to rebuild their life with your violence. So I'm gonna call Andrew and Kenneth. So the honorable mention category for our poster 
uh, I believe it's that poster, uh, is Adrian La, 10th uh, grader from Sacred Heart Cathedral Prep. Where's Adrian? Please come on up. Thank you so much for being here. 